Hi, welcome to the first of the low-tech videos. We're going to test the low-tech part today because there are people stomping around on the roof and there's stuff crashing into a dumpster right outside the studio window. So if you hear loud noises, uh, please bear with me as a new roof is going on my house. And um, in the meantime and around all of that, we will see if we can't show you how to present your watercolors without frames or glass today. So let's get started. Okay, so for this step, you're going to need the watercolor that you want to seal. I'm going to just use a postcard because I don't have one right now that's ready to be mounted. You'll need some airbrush medium. I'm using Liquitex, but it doesn't really matter which brand. And again, the article will give you more information about that. And a mouth atomizer. This particular one is the Pat Dews atomizer, and it's kind of pricey. I think it's about $30 or $35, which is an awful lot if you know that you can buy little atomizers for spraying fixative for about, oh, I don't know, 2 or $3. But the smaller ones, especially the ones that fold up, they're intended for fixatives that are based um, with alcohol or spirits or something with a very low molecular weight. And um, those things are a lot easier to spray than water-based things, and especially things that have acrylic medium in them. So you can use those but you may need to be revived after you hyperventilate. So then the, the last thing I need is a little bottle just to put some of this in because I need to dip the end of this down and by this point my airbrush medium is too far down for the end of my atomizer to reach. So just to make that easier, I'm going to put some and this is just a little bottle that um, some essential oil came in and it's a handy size because the depth is just right. And then I just pour this back into the bottle when I'm done. Now one trick about using a spray atomizer is when I, I put the, uh, the end of the atomizer into my liquid and then I'm going to spray hard into this end, blow hard into this end, but I want to start a little bit off the surface, aim it over here off the surface of my painting because I might get some blobs or droplets first, first few um, bits that come out of here. So I'm going to blow hard and I'm going to move back and forth. Hmm, might have been good to tape that down even. Okay, this is sitting on a piece of freezer paper because freezer paper does not adhere to acrylic. So even if there's some underneath, uh, if it were regular paper or craft paper, it might glue itself to the surface. I think you can see there's a, just a, a sheen of liquid on the top. I don't want to spray so hard that I get puddles because then I, I might redissolve some of the thicker applications of paint. So I want just an even coating. Now I'm going to go away and let that dry completely, um, preferably even overnight, especially if it's humid the way it is right now. And then I'll come back and do a second and possibly a third application before I go to put my varnish on. So the next step will be the varnish. Oh, and one important thing, be sure to rinse your atomizer with clear water right away. I rinse mine by kind of dropping it into a bucket of water and then I actually go and blow some clear water through it. You don't want that acrylic medium drying inside here, it'll clog it up. Okay, so next step is going to be, after we've done our three coats here, we're going to come back and do some varnish with a brush. Okay, so now uh, we have a painting that's already had several coats of airbrush medium put on it to make sure that any watercolor is not going to move. This one happens to be watercolor and acrylic, but this white right here is white watercolor, so that would definitely move if I didn't seal it first. So I'm going to stick a little bit of tape on the back just so that while I'm working here, it doesn't slide around on me. And then um, we're going to use Minwax Polycrylic. Let's just open that up. Don't shake the can. I know it's tempting, but you're going to just make uh, froth bubbles in there, get air turned into it. You don't want that stir stick. So stir it up rather than... shaking it. Okay. I like to use a reasonably soft brush 
Um, and I like using a filbert. Some people prefer flat. Doesn't really matter. You can experiment and see what brush works out. But this self levels, so you don't have to worry too much about brush marks. And I'm just going to go ahead and apply plenty. Don't go crazy over brushing it. You can just go right off the edge because again we're on that freezer paper. And now I'm going to go quickly pick up any excess just so I don't have any puddles. You can use gloss or satin or a combination whatever your preference any one of them works fine. Okay now I'm gonna let that dry and I usually do a second coat in the other direction not so much because it needs two layers to be protected, but because if I happen to miss any spots, the second coat will hopefully catch them and I won't miss the same spots twice. So that is the top coat layer. You can treat this as your final varnish if you don't ever want to be able to reverse it. If you do want to be able to reverse it, then you would add a couple layers on top of this. This would become your isolation coat and you'd add a couple layers of golden UVLS water-based varnish on top um, and the article goes into that in more detail but basically you can remove the golden varnish without removing this layer this protects the painting underneath so if the varnish ever becomes dirty or contaminated it can be removed and re-varnished without affecting the painting so the next step is to attach this to something that will support it so that we can present it either without a frame or inside a frame but without glass. Okay, for this next step, we're going to need a painting that's been varnished and ampersand gesso board. Do not use clay board or aqua board. The clay coating will come off and you won't get permanent mount. So when you first get this, take it out of the package. The sides also have not been um, varnished or finished in any way and usually the first step that I do is to go ahead when I unpack a bunch of these go ahead and varnish the sides and that can be done with the Minwax or with the golden varnish whatever you happen to have on hand um, and that's just because if I set this down now in my studio and there's some paint somewhere um, the surface won't be porous anymore, so if I get a little bit of something on there, I'll be able to clean it off. But if you're going to go right into mounting it and you're working carefully, you don't have to do that first. The next thing we're going to need is some gel medium. This happens to be Golden's Soft Gel Matte. Um, I think the soft gel is easier to work with than the regular gel or the hard gel, just easier to spread, but any one of them will work. Matte finish, gloss finish, doesn't matter. It's going to be hidden. So whatever you have on hand, it doesn't have to be golden, it can be another brand. And then a brush that's relatively stiff because you need a little bit of stiffness to spread that medium. And I get my brush damp, add a little bit of liquid. Now I'm going to take my painting, put it face down, and put a generous amount of gel medium all over the back of it. Trying not to get a whole bunch on the front, but it's not a, don't panic if you get a little bit on the front. Um, it's all acrylic medium, just like whatever else you've got on the front. And we're going to unify the final gloss after everything's mounted. So even if I'm using matte medium and I had a, wanted to have a gloss finish, I can fix that in the next step. Now I'm also applying plenty of gel medium to my support which is the gesso board. My gesso board is cradled. You don't have to buy it that way. You can get just the board. So if you want to put this in a frame you can get it without this part here. This is called the cradle um, and have just this last little bit of masonite and then you would just frame it like any painting on board. So now I'm going to take my painting and I can kind of feel underneath to center it. And I've got some working time. This doesn't dry instantaneously, so I've got a little time to 
position it and you'll see I purposely make my paper about a half an inch over the size I intend the final piece to be so that I've got a little wiggle room. If you try to make this exactly right and get it all to line up, that's going to be pretty hard. So once we have this glued down, we'll trim it. But right now, I want to get it positioned and I want to make sure there are no air bubbles. So what I do when I think I've got the position about right is I start to fold the edges down a little bit so that I can see from the top where it's centered. And I like that. Once I get that position, I start working my way out from the center to the outside, kind of rolling my hands to push out the extra medium and to get this to adhere. And again, I've got some time to work here. This takes a while to set up. What you don't want to do is a lot of scrubbing motion like that with a lot of pressure. Even though this is a sealed surface, the paper is going to absorb some moisture from the back. And so I can get away with a little bit of this. If I do a lot of it, I may start to actually rub the surface off. That coating of acrylic might soften up, especially if it's relatively new. So I try to just press. Some people ask me, can you use a brayer or can you use a rolling pin? And the answer is sure, you can do that. I've just had better luck with this. What I'm doing right now is I'm looking for air bubbles and making sure that I'm working them all out. Because if you do have an air, bu an air bubble after it's all dry, I don't know of any way to fix it. So it's worth taking your time here. Sometimes if I have an air bubble, I can lift up a corner and start again from the middle and work that bubble out. You see, I still have a fair amount of working time here. And if I'm careful, I can do a little of this smoothing, but then when I start really applying pressure, I want to use the side of my hand or the flat of my hand. And that looks pretty good. Okay, now the next step is going to be to flip this face down and weight it, but I want to do that on a clean piece of freezer paper because you see here I do have um, leftover medium, so I don't want to leave sort of blobs on the front. So we're going to take a fresh piece, piece of freezer paper. Okay, and I have a towel over my table here just to cut down on the glare for the video. But you really want this to be on a, f a flat, hard surface. So I'd move my towel out of the way and get my fresh piece of freezer paper, clean sheet. I'm going to make sure one last time I haven't dislodged anything and put this face down. Once I've done that, I want to check all the way around because there may be, looks like this one's pretty good, but there may be little blobs of medium that have worked their way to the edge. So I can take a sponge or paper towel and I'm just gonna wipe right along that edge just in case there are any drips or blobs of medium. Then I'm gonna put any kind of a board on top just to distribute the weight. And everyone keeps these in their studio, right? So a little weight, you could use books on the top. And now I'm gonna go away and leave it overnight to dry. So the next morning this is what it looks like. Everything is glued down, it's dry, and I have this excess that I need to trim off. So I have a uh, one of those self-healing cutting mats. This is a small one. You can get larger ones and it's a real help for doing this step. And I'm going to place the work face down and take an X-Acto knife and I'm going to just trim all four edges. So let me see if I can get a closer view of that for you. All right, I think you'll be able to see what I'm doing here. I'm taking my X-Acto knife. I'm going to start on the outside and cut to the corner. And then when I get to the corner, I want to make sure the blade is right along that edge, but I don't want to um, 
cut into the wood there. This is soft enough wood that your X-Acto knife can kind of shave a little bit off. So I rest the handle of the knife against the cradle and I use that as a guide and then I'm just going to cut it's actually in a shadow to me so it might be in a shadow to you too it looks like I didn't cut all the way through because I couldn't see what I was doing all right nope not quite Okay, so now this is attached just at the corner because it's hard to start right at that corner, so it's better to let this um, this final corner get cut off when I get all the way around. So I'm going to move on to the next spot, and I'm going to turn it to to see if I can find a place where the camera can see and I can see at the same time. So starting right in that corner, resting the side against the cradle as a guide, and we'll trim that side. And as you saw, when I get to the end here, I should have gone a little slower. There's a place where the handle comes off and the blade's still there. And to keep that even, you want to try to hold that same angle. And I didn't do a very good job of it on that side. So let's see. Oh, I can't see. It's in shadow. It's not the ideal situation to try to cut across from yourself where you can't see. And that final corner. Right. And now we have a nice clean edge that just matches the edge of our cradle. And okay, and here's what it looks like when it's all finished. Um, when I do this, I, after the step of trimming the edges, I do another coat of varnish across the front and around all four sides to seal everything and um, or isolation coat. And then if I'm going to do a removable varnish, I'll do that on top, um, at least on top of the front surface, but I usually just go ahead and ro uh, run that over the sides as well. Now, here is one. That's all finished, so you can see at the back. Um, I just attach a wire. I like to put mine on the inside just so that it will lay flush against the wall, or if I'm packing several for me, this keeps them from um, gouging into each other. And then I like to sign the inside of the cradle on the back with a um, waterproof pen. And I don't think you can read this, but I also stamp the back inside with my studio information, um, my logo and website. And these small ones make a very nice presentation just sitting on a bookshelf. And um, the larger ones sit on the wall and actually stand away from the wall a little bit. It makes a nice um, kind of like a gallery presentation, very clean. Um, contemporary presentation that I like a lot for my watercolors and I hope you will too so give it a try and uh, let me know how it goes for you. So I hope that's enough to get you started mounting your watercolors and displaying them without glass or frames. If you like the look of a frame you can mount your watercolor on a board without the cradle and put it into a frame just like any painting on a board. And there are other options that you might want to consider, and I get into that more in the article that accompanies this video. Um, also in that article, you'll find information about the products that I use and alternatives to those products, and um, some information about what those products look like or where to find them for the ones that you might not have encountered in your art supply store. So thanks for watching. I hope this was helpful, and I uh, hope to see you again soon.